listening to Second Wind with Joyce Buford, where women who are ready to expand their life adventure discover the tools to stop playing small and tap into the courage required to enjoy their second wind. Welcome. Good morning, everybody out there. I am delighted to know that you are with us today. You know, it's always so interesting how we get so busy, but there are some things you can't really smooth over or skip over. You just feel like the week isn't complete if you don't do the listening. And so I really can, for those people that are out there every week for Second Wind, I send a big thank you. It's great to know that you're there. I really hope that you are benefiting from the programs that come our way. I am always thrilled to know some of the people that do come our way and the messages that they have to share. Today, our guest is going to share, I, I kind of like say she's got an answer to some of the difficult parts of parenting. And we all need that help sometimes. So, Stay tuned, and you're going to love Vanessa Kalon. Now, Vanessa lives in San Francisco, California, um, far, far, far away from Texas. You know, that's where I'm from. But anyway, we, we're um, so anxious to hear the news that she has. Now, she has a master's degree in, what were those? In psychology? Clinical, psych- <laughs> clinical psychology. Yes. Clinical psychology. Yes. And she is the founder of Kalon Family Services School, Services School, a nonprofit organization that provides education for K through eight, along with resources and support to families with strong willed children. If you have one, you know you're supposed to be here today. <laughs> and that she likes, she likes to endearingly call the two E the twice exceptional children. Now she's going to tell us about her program. She has spent years in developing her curriculum. She also works with um, individuals in their particular need, like coaching and supporting families and managing how to manage their children through their daily lives. Now she's written three books. And today we're going to talk about the one Parenting with Vanessa Kalon, which is out, Vanessa? Is it already yeah. are all these out? It's, it's out. out. It's out and it's in Spanish too. So we have two languages going on. <laughs> oh, that's great. And so anyway, she lectures at school. She's very well respected in this field. And so I'm thrilled that she is on second wind. So welcome, my dear. It's always great to have interesting people on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm really honored. So <laughs> yes, well, this has gotten to be, you know, uh, strong willed children are not an exception anymore. There are a <laughs> lot of strong willed children. Um, I, I think I have a grandchild that way. But <laughs> I mean, there's nothing child. wrong with being strong willed. It's just how you the tools you get yes. how to help the child steer in the right direction, right? Yes, how you can work it out together. Yes, so 100%. Tell, us, tell me how you got into this area. What was the strong draw for you to work in this area? So, you know, when you ever go looking for a job and you never get a job, yeah. <laughs> it just, it, it <laughs> children have always like just kind of fallen in my lap and anytime I've tried to do something different it just never worked and it was one of those things where it's like one family would hire me then the next family would hire me then I'm like okay I'm done now and this is when I was 18 17 working with kids who have autism and back then you know that was like 25 years ago or you know so we're not gonna say my age but a lot of people didn't know what autism was or they didn't know you know other things so I was trained back then. And then every time I try to leave, just kidding. It never, and no one ever wanted me or I would get fired. Cause I do have an opinion. <laughs> oh, a strong willed child teaching strong. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, my first job at 16 was, uh, my mother hired me and my mother fired me within two weeks. Oh, like no, no joke. Yeah. 
Now, was she also <laughs> in the same area or of interest or not? No, she owned a travel agency. And I just like, I see big picture and she sees details and I just don't see details. So I don't understand why things have to like be perfect. But for her, like, like the presentation is really important. And to me, I don't care. Oh. <laughs> <It's> the- <laughs> yes. I think that's quite common between mothers and daughters. Um, That's a really challenging relationship. (laughs) But tell me why you made the statement prior to while we were just visiting that you see a growth in this area that parents are struggling with always saying no, 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 no. And they're always, but there seems to be more um, uh, what would you call it? Um, battles in the family between the parents between. Yeah, no, there's a couple of things that I see. I find that a lot of parents, so there's a couple of things, right? Parents are scared to say no. I think that we've said the message that kids need to, you know, explore things and process everything. And I, under, I understand that. And I agree with that, but there's also boundaries and consistency that I feel like it's, there's a lack of at times. And so when the child doesn't feel like, well, who's in control and who's the one making the decisions, right? And it's me, that's where a child gets more and like, I'm going to control every situation, which to me is the child that is is going up, is a little anxious, like who's in control and who's not. I also find that parents are so scared of a behavior that they change the environment so that the, there is no behavior. But what are they doing is that they're coddling the child. So it's almost like when they when the child goes out into the world and it doesn't go their way, then there's a massive, like schools are struggling. Um, and I feel like there's, like behaviors aren't bad. I think we look at behaviors as like, oh, my child's gonna act out and be embarrassed. That's them learning yeah. to me. So like how are we increasing a child's frustration tolerance and how do we help them become part of the community in the world but if you're a parent that's worried that their kid's going to embarrass them, you know, then you're changing your own behavior to protect your child. And in the end, it's increasing behaviors mm-hmm. and making it worse later. Uh, that makes sense? Yeah. Yeah, I do think I, I can remember in my parenting years that, um, yeah, it would be embarrassing if your child really did get up and scream and run around the room. Um yeah, I think all parents are kind of like that. Honestly. Yeah, so that, but at the same time, there's so more kids doing that. And I also feel like if you're going to a birthday party, just call the parent you're having a child. Like, hey, my, my child has, you know, has some behaviors at times. Transitions are really hard. How do we set the child up for success? Can you help me? Maybe the child goes in a couple minutes earlier. You, ha- you have a plan, but it's not changing the whole thing or it's a, it's not avoiding going right so a lot of times these families become a little island because they don't want you know they don't want to upset somebody else they don't want their child to do x y and z so then how is the child learning these life skills and coping skills right yeah uh out of the three books that you have written have you addressed that specifically and in which one so i they are, those come up with strategies. Um, they have been addressed in how to do parenting with confidence and, and all of them are kind of addressed, but I'm really about giving tools and specific like language. So when your child is upset, how do you handle that? And what do you say to your child? You know, it's one thing to say, okay, well, you know, your child's upset and like, they're explaining why, but what, what is, what can you do differently? Right. So that's what I'm looking for. So when a child is upset, understand that they can't process information coming in. So what you want to do is say, let me know when you're ready to talk. That's it. Oh, oh. we're not, we're not negotiating. We're not battling. The minute you find yourself battling with it, you lost. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Common sense responses, right? Yeah. Like you're talking- it's like going back to the basics. So it's kind of like forgetting that you're talking to a three, four year old and approach it as if it were almost a, an adult. How would you yeah. approach that? But a lot of people have a trouble even approaching other adults with a good tone. Right. And the other thing is I found a lot of kids that I work with have extremely high IQs. So it's almost like when you say, you know, to me, when someone says to a kid, uh, what would you have said? What could you say differently? I'm like, they would have said it already. If they knew it. And it's almost like condescending, in my opinion, uh-huh. that they're saying, okay, I'm, to me, I'm like, I'm going to give the language. 
And the more that you're giving the language, the more you're creating that muscle memory, you're creating that piece of like, okay, in this situation, this is what we do, right? I'm not going to take something from a child or I'm not going to hit you when I'm frustrated. I'm just going to say I'm mad. But if they had the language, they would have said it, right? So like how a child will want to do well if they have the skill set. Right. Yeah. Well, that brings up another question for me. So are you against um, the spank? Uh, yeah, no, I don't do spanking. No spanking. Okay. No spanking. And I don't do timeouts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll just get that out. You know, I mean, spanking to me is like, you're becoming this, to me, it's about the relationship and like how you're communicating with one another. You can communicate, but if you're going to go spanking, you as the adult need the break. <laughs> like you're the one who needs to take a break. But that also, that is normal. Like there's times I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to strangle you right now, child, but I'm not going to do that. I might feel it, but I'm not going to do that. But what I'm going to tell model the child to say, you know what, right now I need a break from you. And when we come back in five minutes, we'll, we'll discuss it or when we're both ready to talk. But again, it comes down to the relationship and the communication that you're having with the child. Yeah. Cause it's about the growth. Like when I go do home interventions, I'm all, I walk in and there, everyone's like, the child's always doing something. I'm like, well, I'm not going to point out it's always the child. It's everybody in the family. It's a family, right? How do we all evolve? Yeah. And I always tell the kid, I go, so what should mom and dad work on? What should you work on? And when you change that to like, oh, it's not just me. It's everybody. Get, need, everyone needs to work on something. The child does really well. Right. It's, it's like when a parent actually says sorry to the child. Mm. Yeah, I made a mistake. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. This yeah. happened last week. What I'm sorry. They don't hear that that much. I'm sorry. No, and yeah, and I was at a school. I was I was helping I was helping at a school recently. And there was a miscommunication between me and a teacher. And I was I it was my fault. Uh well, I don't know whose fault it was, but I had to apologize because I guess I didn't know the rules because they weren't explained to me, but I put the, you know, I had to help the child like self-regulate a little bit, but I didn't realize where. And he was like, no, it's over here. And I'm like, well, and they were, they didn't hear me him say it. And I didn't ask, but I was wrong. And so afterwards I, you know, I went up to the child and I said, you know what? I'm really sorry that that was a stressful situation that I caused not realizing it. And that goes far. How do people know? We made, you made a statement to me before we got on the air. And, it, and you said that this, this type of child, the over anxious child, the acting out child, am I getting this straight? Yeah. Is aggressive. You see more of this behavior since COVID. Since oh, our, yeah. I what, just, what's your thinking behind that? You know, I think for, I just met with a, a assistant superintendent down in LA and she, we were talking about this because my, I'm looking at getting my programs into districts and before it was more special ed, but now we're going into more mainstream because it works with everybody. And I think what they're finding is that during COVID, whether, you know, the parents are really anxious, the kid picks up on that, or, you know, the child's going to always follow the parent's lead. And I mean, there's times I was out during COVID, even just the bank. And I remember, you know, a, a, a son like picked, like touched the number of the bank of America, like on the outside and the dad, like, no, 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 no. You can't do that. You can't do that. Where's the hands? Where's everything. So it's almost like, there's just this anxiety of like making a mistake or not sure what's going to happen. Um, am I going to die if I get sick, if it wasn't explained? So these kids are dealing with a lot. And then also not being in school, like, how do you sit? How do you learn? And a lot of times kids are like, okay, I'm just going to eat on the, on, on the watching TV, you know, understanding that everybody comes in the community. And then all of a sudden, when you have structure and rules from no structure, you have behaviors. Yeah. And then we have multiple kids in a room. You have a lot more behaviors. Right. Well, how much did the parents having to teach in, back during those days, did, did that cause any issues or was the change or was it just the old, whole uncertainty of that time? You, you know, parents have to work. You know, so it's not the parents' fault. I mean, they have to work. And sure. some people, you have, you know, two to three jobs just to make it. I mean, and in some, you know, from some districts from I've heard that they would get a computer and they didn't have money for food. So they sold the computer, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're, so you're looking at kids on the, on, on a whole scale of things. If the families can't get their basic needs met, education falls back. Yeah. So, and so there's a lot to, to look at on, on that level, 
right? Because I know I've talked to a couple of director friends and they, you know, they've had experiences where they, they give out, they give it all out, but it's hard. And if you have, so in my school, I don't do homework because I, I feel like the family at home life should be simple. And the only thing I'm going to give them is something that they've already mastered. So the paint, so the child can show, look what I've done. Look at the profits I made. How, how do we build that trust in the community and that love together versus like, okay, I'm struggling all over again. And then I have another issue with X, Y, you know what I mean? It's just, when you have a child with behavioral issues, they always identify as that. So how do you change that identification to something positive when we have less behaviors? Can you share some practical examples of underreactions and challenging situations? Yeah. <laughs> I always tell people, I go wiggle your toes. And they're like, what do you mean? I go, if you're really upset me, I just wiggle your toes. If the minute you start paying attention to your toe toes, <laughs> like, you become a little more grounded. But my kid, they actually, they think I'm a little nutty when I say that, but my teenagers, they're like, it actually worked during a test. Same for parents. And I think the under reaction is just like, Okay, let me know when you're calm and you stay calm. The more that I don't know if you'll realize the more a child's escalated than you're escalated, you just keep it going. And some kids like that negative attention. And so they're like, oh, this is amazing. This is how I'm gonna get my mom's attention or dad's attention. So I'm gonna keep doing it. Versus, okay, let me know when you're calm and then we could talk about it. Oh yeah. You know, and I'm not and it, it's just, I think the biggest thing is, you know, you, the child needs to understand that their base and their security is the parent. And that is them being calm because the minute that you start, the, I, I think, I don't think parents realize when you, one day you're calm, the next day you're not, then the next day you're calm. And then you're, you're not, you're not, you're not. Then maybe one day you're calm. Um, imagine how that child is feeling when they don't understand what they're going to receive when they're upset. That causes a lot of anxiety. Like, what am I going to get? Who am I going to get? You're making me think. <laughs> Sitting here thinking, uh, challenging. It's a good me. thing. It's a good thing. Children in my family. So, <clears throat> a, saying yes. Now, these are some of the questions you supported me with. Saying yes to your child's request may seem easy to say yes, which means making them happy. But what tools or strategies can parents use to make? this approach more successful in fostering positive. Right. So the thing that with, you know, saying yes, it's okay. So they want iPad. It's three 30. They come home and it's like, you could have iPad, but after you do X, Y, and Z. So you're not saying no right away, which then causes a behavior. You're saying, okay, do you know see the difference in the language right there? So it's like, okay, you can have it, but after you're done, Versus just saying, no, not right now, but they could get it later. But the kid, the child doesn't know that. Yes. Mm-hmm. So that's the kind of stuff that, and like giving the child choices, you want to do this first or this first, which one do you want to do? Oh, that's good. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and when they want the third choice, no, that's a controlling child. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, interesting. <laughs> Well, because you'll have it like, okay, pick up the blue crayon. Go pick up everything else but the blue crayon. And I talked to a parent about this and he's like, I'm just happy they're doing it. I go, you, no, your dad, your kid is telling you, I'm not going to listen to you. I'll do everything else but what you say, but what you're saying. And to me, that's a problem. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> it is. But that parents don't realize language. like, oh, well, they, <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> you know it's like everything's on the floor and they'll do everything else but it's to me that's a child like I'm just gonna hand over hand take their hand and put it thank you very much and walk away and that they're gonna escalate real quickly but I'm all I said the blue one Mm. because a lot of times I don't think people realize a child that is super controlling like that is also someone who is super anxious so the more you give into that anxiety the more that you're going to see more of them trying to control everything that play becomes control. Um, you can't, you can only follow their lead. You can't, they're not going to let you other kids come in and play with them. So then you're working at social skills and you're looking at, you know, life skills, how you work together with people. How important is it to um, create um, structure? I would call it like when you're in the playroom or they're playing, They come into a space that's always a mess and it's their playroom. We in my, when growing up, we never had the luxury of a playroom, which was really the mess. So some 
So we always had to pick up cleanup. And what does that do for the growth of the child if you can instill some of those um, responsibilities, I guess, is what I'm looking for. A hundred percent. And what I like to do is teach why you want to do that. <laughs> so I think a lot of times parents you didn't want to do it, but I, I, I don't think parents understand if you have a child that's unorganized and how they process information or they get overstimulated really quickly An unorganized room, it's not going to help them. Hmm. It's going to keep them unorganized. Right. And yeah. so being able to teach that there's a start and a finish, we start something, we finish it, we clean it up. That's what the skill set you want to be teaching. So that's the cleanup skill that you're looking at. Right. So and then where be, else can you build those skills? If it's not in the playroom, where yeah. else can you build them? Eating dinner, putting your plates away. Right. I even have some kids put have a drawer that's close, like on their level, so they can set the table. Yes. You know, that that's also kids love, you know, the thing kids love this stuff. They feel like they're responsible, they're part of the family, they're doing things, but it's just the parents saying, Hey, what what do you want to do? Helping, you know, the the I have a, sometimes some kids will have a list of like put on your clothes for the morning routine and the bedtime routine. And when they check it off themselves, that's increasing their self-esteem and increasing their independence. So those things really work well. Hmm. Yeah. And I always tell parents, it doesn't matter what order you do. Like when you go to bed, like, do they have to brush your teeth beforehand? Cause I don't think people, parents realize how ritualistic they are. And so, and then it's when like, okay, well, my kid always has to have a certain way. And I'm all, let me see it. How much are you like that? Like how often are you setting the child up like this, not realizing you're doing it? So how do parents accept when their child does it differently? Is that, I mean, I can see where they want, they're used to their routine and so they try to force it on their child. Right. If the child is totally different, then how do they step back and allow him? Just recognizing that he has his own routine that he needs to follow for his own uh, self-esteem? You know, I think, so I think if you have a kid that's super anxious and they follow the parent's routine and what they're doing, I think switching it a little bit is important for the child, Hmm. right? Now, if a child who's like, I want to do X, Y, and Z in my own way, it doesn't matter. In my opinion, it doesn't matter as long as it all gets done. Now, if it becomes a control battle, and it's like, I, it's a battle between the child and the parents. That's when I'm like, we're going to do it. We're going to, you know, today, like say on Tuesday, we're going to set it up to where I'm going to do, we're going to do it this way. Wednesday, you could do it your way. Right. So again, it's about the relationship and talking about it, but like, okay, you can have it your way this day, but the next day it's my turn. When does a parent realize that they need outside support? That's a good question. I think it depends on, you know, you know, the culture, their beliefs, their back, like what they're thinking. Um, if they think that they can like save it and not, and just do it, no one else is going to understand my child. I think there's a lot of psychology behind that. I think that early invention is key, especially if you're starting to see that your child is not talking, um, doing more physical stuff. You're getting reports back from the school that they're not playing with other children. Like that's when I would start to say like, we need to look at outside help. So you would wait until school years? I mean, we can have it younger, but I think if parents are, you know, if they're hitting, biting, <laughs> I mean, basic behaviors, yes. But again, like parents have a, you know, you, and we do it too. Like they have this story of like why it happened yeah. <laughs> versus like my child needs help. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. So I'm just thinking of the, and part of that is because of my personal life. And I'm kind of thinking of some of these with a much younger child. So up until six, there's, it's all exploring or is there anxiety that goes on with the child? Oh, you, you see, I see a lot younger, three, two. Okay. All right. Yeah. And what are some of those signs? Are they, are they tip, some typical signs? Yeah. I mean, some kids are like, you're going to sit here and you're going to sit here and no one else can change these seating arrangements. Mm-hmm. I'm only going to play one way. It, you go, you really want to look at the play skills. Is it expanding past parallel play? Right. Are you looking at, you know, can your child, child follow two-step directions? If you say, come here, are they listening? Or are they just hitting you when they're doing something? I mean, you can go as young as two or, I mean, really young. Mm-hmm. 
Mm. So it, it's looking at, are there a lot of the behaviors coming up that don't seem typical? Okay. Like language and being able to go, go like, and then going to the park, are they playing with other children? Yeah. My grandchild keeps running away from his father who's there all the time. Is that a, I mean, what is he? So why, why, like, why is he running away? Is it like a game? It's like a game. Yeah. See, don't chase. I don't, I have a rule with kids. Unless it's a safety issue, I will not chase a child because that becomes very scary if you're out in the community and they think it's funny to go run in a grocery store and then you lose your child. So there's like zero chasing and I'll tell a child, um, and this is how I work with kids. I let them know what I'm going to do. There's no surprise. In it. <laughs> right. And if I do do a, a curveball, I'm like, okay, that that's going to happen the next time, but we're just not going to do this now. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so for me, it's like, okay, I, you want me to chase you. I understand that, but we're just not, I'm not going to chase you or we can chase in this room right here, but I'm in charge of the boundaries of where it's going to go. So again, they feel like they have control. You could chase them, but you're, it's under your control. Okay. But his, my son's feelings, who's the parent, um, that child is, he feels he's running toward the street. So he feels like he needs to catch him. No, if he's running towards the street, you have to catch him. That safety right. is first, right? right? Um, or what I would do is say, have, so for this situation, I would talk to, I would have your son talk to his son and say, okay, let's see how far you, when you run like this, show me how far you're going to go without going in the street and I'll stand by the street. Right. So you're blocking it. So you want it. So I'm going to ask the child, what, what's your plan? What, like, where are you going to go? How, when are you going to stop? Like, what is it going to be? Let's see. How far do you travel? Do you go to Texas? <laughs> I do actually. I mean, <laughs> I do. I travel. <laughs> I'm in Las Vegas right now at a conference. And then I met another family in Vegas here for a consultation. Um, I'm looking at maybe going to uh, Colorado soon. No, I do travel. It's fun. You know, it's fun for me. And I think I don't know if people realize when I travel and I'm in the home, I get to see everything. So it's not like you're going to an office and kids know what to say. So I get to see it all. And within like a day, we're good. We have a huge intervention. You know, I'm kind of like the nanny on TV, but like, how do we get that in there? Yeah. Do you do like visits through the um, internet? Yeah. And I have, work, I have parenting workshops and stuff like that that'll be starting when the school year starts. Oh, that's good to know. Where do they go to get additional information? So you can go to my website and it's Vanessa, V A N E S S A. K-A-H-L-O-N.com. I also provide um, on TikTok and like Instagram, like free tips and stuff like that, that I add in just to kind of help parents that, that are struggling and that maybe just need a little extra support. Um, and then maybe it's like, oh, maybe my child, sh they, we should reach out to somebody if they're looking for certain signs. Mm -hmm. Now you also created, I was looking at this and I, I was, really thought it was very clever on your part, Vanessa. You do <laughs> Ye's yoga? Is that yeah. right? Or Y-E-A? Yeah, it's yeah, yoga. Yeah, yoga. Yeah. What? Yaz yoga. Yaz yoga. So what is that and how does that help with their curriculum? Yoga. So it's, it's, I, I use it for a social skills group. Um, yoga, I feel like for kids, like downward dog is always downward dog. You know, there are certain things that are always a certain way. Parents have a hard time playing. So yoga, I think is so mainstream. It's very typical for parent and child to actually interact in a way to build on there. And if you're looking at like, oh. if you, if you tell a child who's three, take a deep breath, what does that mean? I mean, like, think about it. I feel like as we're looking at language and child and children and their development, it doesn't make sense. So it's like, how do you teach breathing? That was once, you know, we want to look at how to make something concrete more, you know, something that's abstract, more concrete. So understanding their body awareness. I also do partner yoga with kids where they have to be able to like follow another child's lead, make sure they don't fall and get injured and hurt themselves, especially kids that have sensory issues. So how do they build that body awareness in there? And I find it's best through yoga, which I have a toolkit and it has all the visuals that go. So with the schedule and everything else, so kids who have autism, uh, it works very well. I have kids that are, who have autism are teaching the classes and doing it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's great. Cause again, it's like, 
you're looking at the start and the finish. There's always the same routine in yoga. You have, you have your breathing at the beginning, your warm up, then you do a little bit of something else in there, and the end partner yoga, and then how you end with the no, like the the breathing piece. So again, when you are consistent. Um, yeah. And when you have the schedule, like, and the kid and it's structure, kids know what to expect. Mm-hmm. And your podcast, that was what I was trying to find. You have a podcast and is it on a regular? Um, it's going to start being on a regular. I have had a lot happen. I dislocated my knee and I've had some family losses this year. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be going back on the regular. Once things start to get, we get back on there. I have a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> Um, and, and I have a list, so we, we have enough information for a while, but yeah, it's about, you know, how, like why sometimes reward systems don't work, why consequences don't work with some children and ways that to kind of work, look at behaviors differently and how one thing can have five different perspectives and like, how are we, how are we viewing those? Cause not everything's negative and I don't think behaviors are negative. Oh, you don't. No, I mean, it's a child learning you know, so it's, again, it's how you look at it, or you're going to be defeated, or you're going to cry. <laughs> mm, <yes>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sometimes I'm like, this is, I'm like, I need a reality show in my school sometimes. Cause I'm like, I, this is like, <laughs> yes. I got kids negotiating with me. Is not yeah. crying allowed. It is one way to relax and get it out of your system. Oh no. And I tell, I help tell my kids, I'm like, I want you to cry. Cause that that's less anger. Like, please just cry and let it out. And that's the one thing I teach too. Cause I'm like, it's so important to have that release versus wanting to hit a wall. I'm all, I would like, I would rather you cry than yes. hit something, please. <laughs> yes. Tears are good. Now you have another question here. Pursuing a relationship and spending quality time with your child can be challenging in today's busy world. Yes, yes, yes. Parents are going in 16 different directions and so are the kids. But how does a parent find that find that time? I know you could say, well, top priority, it's what's more important than that relationship with your child. I wouldn't say that. Huh? <laughs> I wasn't gonna say that. I wasn't gonna say that. <laughs> No, I mean, listen, to me, it's hard. And sometimes you don't like, listen, let's be honest. I work in a lot of homes. Sometimes you don't want to be with your kid and that's okay. And I think that's one of the things it's like, if your child is challenging and you had a hard day at work, sometimes it's hard. So I think being, being sensitive to yourself and not being hard on yourself and then doing five minutes. I ask for five minutes a day where you don't ask any questions and you follow your child's lead. And that is hard enough. Only five minutes a day is a five is the beginning point because the reason why I say five minutes a day is because we're talking about not asking them how their day was. We're we are not, we are just gonna follow their lead and connect with them on their level. That's it. What does that look like? It looks like whatever the kid wants to do, you're gonna do. Oh, so you what do you so you have an agreement? Yeah, I would say we're gonna have our five minutes. Yeah, I'm really yeah we, we have our family meeting. These are the goals uh, I want to connect, but it's not going to be like, how was your day? Do, and then if you're, if you're older kids, like trying to figure something out, if they're gaming, show me how to game. If they're doing something, connect with them on their level. Mm-hmm. But that five minutes is the hardest thing for parents to do. Cause they're wanting to talk and like, like sometimes the nonverbal communicate, like the not is what you want to do. Having the child teach you something that what, whatever they're doing, if you're drawing, just draw with them. Don't sit there and say, you know, what color is this? Cause we go into teaching mode versus like just being with your child. But I do think some parents need to, you know, they are feelings that you need to have a break. And, and I think that as a society, we should accept that. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's hard to be a parent. And if you have a parent with special needs or a child that's strong willed and doesn't listen to anything like you, it's, it's like, why do I want to go home and hang out with them? But doesn't the TV, isn't that where the TV or, or this little, it's what I would call their iPad, but really it's a toy thing that has recorded. Yeah. Um, is it okay that they go and do that? That's their chill time. Is it not? But is too much of it too much? Is it an escape for them as well? Yeah. And I think that we're always on. So, okay. So I have a weird thing on this. I have a school for kids that, you know, are a lot at times 
And sometimes, yeah, like I'll give them the tablet, but we'll do 20 minutes. So there is a time on that and they're going to be doing Minecraft, but they're going to do Minecraft after the end of the day. Right. And during snack, I will put on a show sometimes if I'm noticing that everybody's bickering at each other and they need a break from each other. Now, as adults, we're always on our phone and I feel like kids, if they, it's like not going overboard, but some is not bad to me. It's not a bad thing. Right. I think that they do need to disconnect, um, watching a movie together, you know, or something like that again, you know, them showing and build that, that to me could be a social skills too. Right. Like we're going in the direction of technology anyways. I mean, we're already there, but you know, it's looking at how does my parent understand me? And so how can I teach when a child can teach the parent, like, okay, this is what I'm doing and how I'm learning that's connection. Mm-hmm. And you know what, the next time the parent asks a child to do something, most likely they're going to do it because they felt that connection. If I, there's times when I've had sessions with kids and it, we're battling and I go, you know what? I'm done. We're going to go get ice cream and pizza. I don't care. We're not going to talk about anything. We're just going to hang out the next time we can, now we can go back into it. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm sort of building a relationship with my grandchildren after some separation. And <clears throat> I noticed that in building this relationship, my Uh, a two-and-a-half-year-old grandson loves the phone, but he loves the picture of us together. So it's all about that. And then my phone comes home and I have tons of pictures that I have to go through, delete. But it's so interesting, but it's the key that helps me connect with him. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I'm going to do that and keep doing it. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. And is that... That's fine. And if it's an object to connect you that, then that's the object, mm-hmm. right? So like it's it, what's right or wrong again, <laughs> you know, it's what you feel in that moment and that what's going to help the relationship. Cause that's what it comes down to. And it's building trust. Right. Yeah. So are there any really good and bad things that we can do? <laughs> I mean, I don't think there's anything bad. I think there's learning opportunity. (laughs) And I think that there's no bad child. There's choices we make. So it's always teaching us that we have a choice. Like there's two choices we can make. What's your choice and what's the outcome? You know, even at three, I'm asking kids, I'm all, you know, it's a choice to be happy. It it is, you know, this world has gotten so crazy. (laughs) Yeah. Like, how do you build resiliency and how do you bring, you know, understand empathy in, in a world that's going so fast? Mm-hmm. So slowing it down. But, you know, if it's an object that connects, you know, especially a child who has autism, it might be a train and that's the way I'm going to connect with them. If it means I'm going to watch a movie and then I'm going to, you know, I'm going to hit pause and stop and I'm work on language and back and forth and turn taking, like there's so many things that you can do within that. I'm not going to just watch a whole movie but I'm going to slowly build things in there. Right. So maybe five or six minutes in, I'm going to pause it. And then I want them to look at me and ask what they want. And I'm working on that on language. So it's looking at, you know, the bigger picture again, bigger picture, why I got fired by my mom. Right. I'm looking at what's going to happen. What's going to help them later on, which is language and it's that all that stuff with their social skills. Mm -hmm. You're thinking so far ahead of me on some of this. (laughs) I mean, that, but that to me, that's my, that's my job. This is why the parents are paying me. You're paying me to make sure that your kid's successful five years down the road, right. right? How do we get there? How, what are the steps that we need to be? How do we build, how do we build kids that have social, emotional intelligence? How are we with empathy and everything? And that's the three R's that I created that I go into different schools and I train on. And it's, how do you build, how do you understand when there's a break in the relationship? How do you repair it? So like, I don't even use the word, sorry. Like, I hate that word. So are you saying breaking the relationship with anybody? Are you anybody, another, yeah, a a child, a parent, you know, a child hitting another kid. And then, you know, a lot of times I don't think people realize if a child has another kid and it wasn't repaired, that kid's going to go home thinking about what they did, which is going to make them feel bad, which it it decreases their self-esteem. They come back the next day and then there's another hit. And that's how the cycle starts. (laughs) Oh. Okay. Right. So these kids that are getting kicked out of schools and doing other stuff. Yeah. Well, we've probably been needing this therapy for many, many years that we, you know, with the gangs and everything that's taking place. Um, is that all a result of bad parenting or weak parenting? No. I don't want. Listen, I, you, there's so many, there's like, you, you, 
I think you can't, it's, you know, it's not always the parent. I think some kids come in with just like a strong will. Like I was very strong willed as a kid. My poor mom, both of my brother and I like, oh gosh, my parents were great parents. I see a lot of great parents that just have difficult kids. <laughs> And then you have these really amazing parents that are so calm and so quiet. And then they have these alpha kids and I'm like, you got to bring your, your personality up, which is, uh, it's not normal for them. The parent you know? has to bring their personality up. Yeah. If you have a kid that's like, like high strung and everything else, and you're like super calm, like, and you need to bring, if you need to bring the kid, he's here and the moms are here, parents here, and they're going, 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 your calmness is not going to bring him down. Sometimes you have to be like, okay, we're in, and then bring him down. Does that make sense? Like yeah. your tone of voice sometimes has to match theirs to bring him down. You always have to be able to match the child on what they need to calm them down. Now, I would like to know, out of the, where would you recommend out of the three books that you've written? that a parent that's listening to you for the first time today and has identified with you many times through <laughs> <laughs> which book does she start with? You know, uh, I love how to do parenting with confidence. I think there's a lot more, you know, the, the shut up and parent. I love the title. Don't get me wrong. So we're gonna have a shut up and parent too, eventually. Cause I just, I, I love that. That was a little abrupt actually. Shut well, up. You know, <laughs> wow. Let me <laughs> So I, I love it because we talk too much and that's the only reason it's like one-liners, like <laughs> you're like, I wouldn't have had you well, on the show. She sold a those. <laughs> <laughs> I have no, I don't pay attention to that. Oh, okay. um, yeah. But with, um, how do parenting it has just more up-to-date information. And the more I'm working with kids, the more I'm coming up with things like, for example, when I did the underreactive, always be underreactive. I realized that with one of the, one of my kids that I had, that's not going to work. So it's just coming up with like, you know, not everything is, doesn't everything you have to kind of take it for what you can and what makes sense for your child. Some kids who are on the spectrum do really well with the token system. My kids do not, right? And then it becomes like, well, if I did my made my bed, will you give me money for that? Oh, did you see I was nice to the other child? Can I get money? Well, no, being kind doesn't make you like you don't get paid for being kind. That's a that's like what you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> oh my like, Vanessa, you cracked me up. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, the problem. The problem is you have kids that's 15, 16 that won't only will do things for something. Yeah. And it's not an internal drive. So I want to teach the internal drive, which is harder to teach. Right. And it takes more time. But if you have the time and you like me, it works great. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the next step for Vanessa? I mean, you're doing so much and helping so many. Do you see the next step? for you? Yeah, I'm in the process and I'm not going to say what school district, but there's a school district in California that I'll be providing. Um, since the book is in Spanish and then in English doing parenting groups for, you know, two or three kids. And that's for kids that maybe are not going to school and everything else and really supporting parents on how to get them back in. And then along with providing that same approach for teachers. So if we can get the teachers and the kids on this, the parents on the same page, are we going to see an increase in reading attendance? Are we going to see an increase in the self-esteem? And then I'm also so looking at, you know, and if there's any teachers that are interested in this, I'm starting a study with my self-care journal, um, which is just doing the journal when something comes up in the classroom for three months and then doing before and after and how it felt and like if it worked when something did happen in the classroom and understanding that the child is suffering and it's not about you and taking it personally. So that would be the next step and along with doing more parenting workshops and trainings for teachers. That's a lot. Yeah. yeah, and another book. I applaud, all of those. <laughs> I applaud them all. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, that would be great. What is the most, uh, you, well, my word this year is joy. And I know that you have uh, your own joy memory. I think we all have those. Right. And so, I wonder if you would share with my audience what, when I say, could you share a joy experience with us? Yeah. What it would that be? So one of my one of my moments was with a little girl that I was working with, um, and it was just happened this year. 
and the family brought me in to go in the preschool because she was like hitting everybody (laughs) and she is also very tall and big for her age so she looks older but it was just when she would frustrate she would hit and like being in groups was very hard for her and so working through it and um, they did an end of the year school performance which is like a basketball game and she was a like a cheerleader and I was just very upfront, like, you 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 could do it, we could do this, or we don't have to, like, it's up to you. And I said, but we've worked all year together, and this is the moment that, you know, we were, I, we, it would be great if you can do it. But if you can't, it's no big deal, too, right? So are we going to try? And she did it. And I was really proud of her to see that performing in front of, you know, 30 people, that all the parents were there, they're playing. But I mean, it was just this amazing thing to see her, like, shine in a way that, you know, it took all those months of you know fighting with her <laughs> she's she's very strong-willed too and just like you know what if you can't be nice we're gonna sit down let me know when you're ready to be nice like <laughs> you know again you want the child to be have some choices so they feel like they're the one thinking about it but that was a moment where I'm like wow you know I'm really doing it because sometimes with these kids it's rep- repetition right and parents are like well you haven't seen a result yet and I'm all, it takes time Everything in life takes time. These are kids. Like, I don't have a magic wand. I don't, but with with the right time and like patience, that's when you're going to see the child shine and become and, be, and like shine who they are. And she was so proud of herself afterwards. And since then, she's been performing and doing other things. She's going to birthday parties with groups. Again, it takes one time for a child to feel that part of feel good about themselves. I'm not like, oh, you're going to get a cookie for doing it. No, it's you're going to feel good about it. You're the one that put in the work. But when you attach an item to something, that's where it takes away the internal. Mm, Yeah, yeah. Where did you feel physically the experience of joy in your body? My heart. And then I always cry. I'm a crier. (laughs) And my kids know I cry. When I get really excited, like, stop it. (laughs) I was like, you're doing that. Leave me alone. (laughs) Well, I think that's good that they can see an adult cry acceptable tears. I did. Oh, a hundred percent. And I, you know, these, my kids are struggling and, you know, for them, when them to, when they're really trying and it, it, it's, they're successful, that's a celebration, you know, you know, I might do like a celebration for the school for it, but they're not going to get it for themselves. I'm like, okay, let's all celebrate your accomplishment together. Right. right? So that's what I would do. So you know, it's like, or a community kindness jar in a school or in a home. When you see kindness in your home, you put it in a jar. Once you get to a certain line, then you have a party together. Again, it's not the child receiving like a token or something. It's the whole family is getting some positive reinforcement. How are they doing? I thank you very much for being on Second Wind. I know there are parents out there with so many questions that would like to get in touch with you you do not provide a telephone number. So how did they get you if they have a question? It's uh, 415-525. Oh, you are giving it. Thank you. I am going to give it. Okay. Uh, I'll give you, it's the schools. I, 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 you still reach me, but it's 415-525-4035. Yeah. Well, it's time. We must part. And I'm sorry about that because <laughs> I know there are questions out there. I keep wanting to hear those my audience out there that's been listening because I could hear their questions come up in their mind but what about this and so anyway maybe they'll pick up the phone and get to you so if you just let me say goodbye to my audience then I'll be back with you thank you so I know there are many parents out there that have just daily challenges with not the child that's difficult but maybe even they have a, tish, a test with a relationship. So anyway, you might want to get Vanessa's new book um, and read. And what was the book again, Vanessa? I don't have that one written. How to do parenting with confidence. And then the teachers, if there's any teachers out there that are interested, it's teaching with heart. Um, and it's on everything's on Amazon. So you'll find that there. So thank you for being here today. Remember to please share this podcast with a friend that's challenging with the child you recognize the child and you feel sorry for the parent so help your friend send her this way to this podcast and she can begin you can do a great gift for her today so 
Till next week, thanks for being here. I hope you have a great week. So bye for now. Joyce Buford returns next week at the same time for another edition of Second Wind. Through the Joyce Buford Empowerment System, women are receiving the support they need through their transitions and are able to reclaim their true purpose with confidence. They receive the tools they need to map out new lives. You can find out more about her coaching services at JoyceBufordEmpowers.com. Thank you.